Hello, everybody. My name is Carl Blythe. I'm the director of the Center of Open Educational Resources and Language Learning uh, here at the University of Texas. And I want to welcome you today to our fourth webinar, fourth in a series of webinars for the FLIGHT project. FLIGHT stands for Foreign Languages and the Literary in the Everyday. The title of this webinar is Publishing Open Lessons for the FLIGHT project. So I want to talk about flight, the, pro the, the specific project uh, that we're calling the, the literary foreign languages and the literary in the everyday, but also talk more generally about what it means to publish an open lesson. What does that mean to even call something open? So a quick overview of the presentation today, what I want to talk about. I'm going to start off by reviewing very quickly what I'm calling flight basics, where this all came from. Um, some of the basic principles that we see in flight. Um, I don't have time to go over in, in any kind of detail of the, the uh, original, the three uh, webinars, but I'm just going to quickly go summarize what I think are the basic principles. And then move on to the, the main issues, which are copyright, educational fair use, and CC licenses. Those are Creative Commons licenses, because it's really about copyright, to understand open education, you need to understand what we mean by open licenses. And then uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how to find open content. Once you understand that content is licensed to be open, how do you find that open content? And then once you find all this different kind of content, how do you package it together in a lesson, in a flight lesson, and license it so that other people have access to it and can use it as open content? And then in terms of flight, our project, how do you submit it to us as a flight lesson? And then we can give you feedback. How do you incorporate that feedback? And then finally have it live on our server for other people to use. So all of those elements uh, will be part of the talk today. So let me start by saying um, to, uh, a little bit of a narrative here. Uh, the flight. Uh, uh, this, as you see a screenshot, is the cover of an OER. An OER stands for Open Educational Resource. An OER can be any pedagogical material. So it, it can be something like a textbook. It can be a grammar book. It can be something as small as a lesson plan. So there are big and there are little OER. Um, and this is actually an OER that was started by Joanna Lux at Cornell University. Joanna it was, at that time, coordinator of the lower division French program. And um, she had been using our, our French OER for first year French called Français Interactif. And um, she called me up one day, a couple of weeks into the semester, and said, I, I really like Français Interactif, but dot, dot, dot. And this is actually, I've had this conversation with many other people who um, start to get involved in open education, because that's usually what happens. You, ad you adopt a textbook, you adopt some kind of uh, materials, and you start to see their limitations, the limitations on the materials once you begin teaching with them. And that's exactly what happened to Joanna. She said, I liked, in general, Francais Interactif, the materials I was using. Um, but and I asked her, please finish that finish that statement, finish that uh, um, your worry there. And she said, you know, I find that there are just not enough readings. Well, actually, there are plenty of readings, but they're not the kind of readings that I want. And as she started to explain to me the context of Cornell and what kinds of readings she was looking for, she said, you know, I I want to help them do more textual analysis, not just literary analysis, but analysis because we have lots of texts uh, in, in, in Francais Interactif, but they were mainly journalistic prose. And she said, yeah, I want different genres. I want them to play more. She had all of these ideas in her head. And I said, well, you know, the whole point of an OER, an open educational resource, is that it is open meaning it, has, it gives you this affordance. You have the right to play with it, to extend it, to rework it. So since Francais Interactif is an OER, go ahead. You have my permission. It's open. So she started developing these really terrific activities, and I was very impressed by her 
ability to to find things on the internet, find these in interesting texts, put them together in a way that allowed her students to learn about language and culture and literacy all in a package. And um, so we started essentially uh, this project. Uh, she came up with the conceit, this notion of the literary in the everyday, which we'll be talking about in just a moment. Uh, which was uh, uh, explicitly trying to find everyday genres to talk about a literariness or this special playful quality of language that we could extend the boundaries and play with rules and so forth. And so she um, ended up writing, um, I guess, a, a, an activity for every chapter. There are 13 chapters in French Interactive. And so this now it comes bundled as, an, as a standalone OER. This is a great example of what an OER is all about. Uh, it starts with an idea, but the idea is prompted by somebody else's idea. And now you can access this, this OER, Le Littéraire dans le Quotidien. We've given you the URL right below it. You can click and buy it, or you can download it for free. It now becomes part of this creative commons, which is a very important thing that we all share and that we all contribute to. So the point being that Joanna's work Joanna's, um, I guess, really intellectual generosity can hopefully fire the imagination of many other people who take part and participate along with her and along with all of us in what we are now calling the Flight Project. These are the key points of how I see Flight. Flight is the acronym that uh, stands for the for foreign languages and the literary in the everyday. Um, by literary, what we mean then is essentially language play. That is, uh, it's, it's not quintessentially or traditionally literature. We're not talking only about canonical literature, because you can find the literary, a literary kind of feel to all kinds of ordinary texts. So we wanted to move away from um, thinking only in terms of literary, meaning literature. And then we partner the literary with the everyday. So everyday genres can be, oh, email and memes and graffiti and the notion of um, the linguistic landscape. Language is all around us. And so is the literary if we pay attention to that. We just kind of have to open our eyes. Now, um, Joanna from day one explicitly said she wanted to overcome this language literature divide, the lang, <coughs> the lang lit divide. Um, that was one of her goals for her own lower division program. And again, she said that she wanted to bring some form of textual analysis into lower division. And it takes the shape of what we're now calling kind of multi, a multi-literacy framework. So again, working on different kinds of text to learn different principles of the language and the culture. So a text-based approach to language learning. Now, also, I think a part of flight basics, if we have to boil this down to what is the essential kind of, what are the basics of this approach, Joanna and Chantel Warner at the University of Arizona, who, who joined with us and myself, the three of us have been playing around with how to, um, how to get at this notion of the literary that we're talking about. And as I said, we, we, we thought about it in the, the notion of language play. Um, play can mean different things, but it, in this sense, it, it means taking what is usually the norm, the default, or what's often called in, in languages and linguistics the unmarked, and pushing it out, extending it somehow into a different dim dimension. Uh, and it's usually then associated with creativity. So you're going beyond the conventional and the established to something kind of new. So language play all the different kinds of sounds and rhymes that, that are in a text. Visual play, so subverting images or multimodality. Word play, grammar play, so you have a paradigm or using different kind of grammatical metaphors, playing with the rules of the grammar, extending them. Genre play, for example, when you take two genres and you mash them up and you create a new kind of hybrid. Narrative play, there are all kinds of different ways to tell a story um, stylistically. Pragmatic play, think of all the different kinds of things that we can uh, talk about in terms of interaction. 
um, different kinds of speech acts, for example. Perspective play is also uh, important in many different kinds of genres. So who is telling the story from which what perspective? Symbolic play, we, we met um, usually what falls under the category of figurative language, so metaphors and metonymies. And finally, culture play, where um, they're pushing the boundaries of the culture in a particular way, uh, as I say here, subverting cultural practices and products. <clears throat> Now, a, a, a text may not exhibit all forms of those different kinds of plays. It may have one or two, or you may choose as a teacher to use a text in a classroom to emphasize just one of those kinds of, of play. But that's what we mean by then literary in the context of this project, using language creatively in these different in these different categories, uh, and using it within the boundaries of a text. So in, um, in Ch Chantelle uh, gave a presentation uh, in her webinar. She focused on the idea of uh, putting this into practice or turning it into a lesson. So all of these different forms of play, how do you actually stage it in a classroom with students? And she gave us the example of a German poem, which I've given you in translation here. So everyone knew. Many knew, most knew, some knew, a couple knew, a few knew, no one knew. And I don't, I yeah, actually removed the title, but her main point that she was talking about was, of course, this plays with the notion of grammar, it plays with the notion of genre, because it looks like a paradigm. And of course, that's a genre that's very well known to students in a classroom. So a grammatical paradigm. So we have conjugations, verbs, the, the verb to know conjugated in the past tense here. And then we have the indefinite pronouns. It's a paradigm. So these are all words that share a, a kind of uh, semantic trait here. So we're playing with the notion of a genre or in grammatical paradigms. And then uh, we, she asked the, the listeners in the webinar to say, so what does this, what are the possible interpretations? Of course, they discussed the idea of knowing or not knowing in the context of historical memory. And since this was in German, of course, people interpret it through the lens of German uh, history. What could possibly be the historical events where people knew and didn't know? People obviously talked about the Holocaust. Um, but not only the Holocaust, because that was also the point that the, the event itself was left unsaid. So there were potentially many different kinds of interpretations. So we're playing with the cultural framework there. Now, um, one of the points that Chantel was making in her talk, in her uh, previous talk, was that you want to take a text, even a simple text like the one I just showed you, and you want to help students unpack it, and you need to do that in what she called pedagogical acts. So this is borrowed from, this is a slide that she has borrowed from uh, the multiliteracies framework. And you see we have different, like four different quadrants here, situated practice, transformed practice, critical framing, and overt uh, instruction. And it's, circu it's circular. Uh, in other words, you, it's not uh, linear. You don't have to start one place and then it's not one, two, three, four. But it goes around. And the, the other idea is that these are acts that you can kind of think about in terms of like bloom taxonomies. They're, they're, they're things that you do with your students. So uh, if you give them a text, part of it will be familiar uh, and part of it may be new. Uh, transforming the practice means transforming the actual doing of the text. So you can uh, actively, you can once you understand all the parts of a text, you can then apply it to something else, and you have have them write the text, for, for, uh, write the genre, or extend it to a new genre. Critical f framing the, that's focusing their attention critically on a text, so that they analyze it functionally, meaning they analyze the different parts of the text, how it all works together, and think about it critically. Who's saying what to whom, and what may be the power dimensions, and so forth. Overt instruction is usually about uh, giving people 
a meta language to talk about a text. So meta linguistic terminology. And uh, here it's called conceptualizing by naming, conceptualizing by theory. But the main point here that Chantel was trying to apply was that we want to take apart a text and all the different layers of meaning of a text gradually. And that's what she called a pedagogical, pedagogical axe. So that's, that's basically what we mean by scaffolding to a lesson. We, we take them through a text and have them read it many different times, not just once, but many different times. <coughs> So let's get right to it, because this is the main point. That, those are all the basics. And what I want to focus on here today is the notion of copyright, because that's really pretty uh, essential to the whole notion of open. So here I've given you um, the definition of copyright as a legal right created by the law of a country that grants the creator of an original work exclusive rights for its use and distribution. This is usually only for a limited time. The exclusive rights are not absolute, but limited by limitations and exceptions to copyright law, including fair use. So a couple comments here. Copyright um, applies to a country. Copyright laws are then different from country to country. So excuse me just a second. OK, and that. Copyright laws in, in and among themselves are not absolute. There are many different if, exceptions to it. It's also highly dynamic because copyright laws can change. <clears throat> when there's new media that, that becomes available to us, we need a new law. And of course, one of the exceptions is this thing called fair use. So most people simply know copyright is the C in the circle. And of course, that's the logo that indicates that the text or the book or whatever, the content that you have is copyrighted. And I like to draw people's attention to the three words that follow the circle, because I think that really summarizes it well. All rights reserved. And uh, this tells you that copyright is actually, when you think about how it's conceptualized, it's actually plural. It's a plural construct in that it implies multiple rights. And all of those rights, then, are reserved by the author and the publisher. The author and the publisher it's like taking all their marbles and saying they all belong to me. Okay, <clears throat> so the what we're trying to do is shift this notion of all rights belonging to the author and the publisher, and basically we're going to talk about sharing those rights. But what are those plural rights? Well, you have the right to copy the, the original work, and this is the right that teachers break all the time. People violate copyright every day. So we see a magazine and we think, oh, that's, that, would be, that would be a great advertisement. I want to use it in my classroom. And so we make a copy of it and we take it into the classroom. We, we violate a copy, copyright law. And typically, when a teacher makes a copy, it's not just one copy. They want to, make dis they want to distribute the copy to all the students. So they, make, they, may, they, they end up making 20 copies and passing them out. That's distribution. That's another right. Um, in addition, then, the third right is the right to make derivatives if you wanted to go in and change the original work. So think about a song, and you want it to go in and change the melody. Uh, and the last right, the right to sell the original work or the derivatives of the, the original for a profit. So imagine taking a Beatles song and changing a couple of um, notes there and then repackaging it and trying to sell it to that. No, 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 that's a violation of copyright. But anyhow, the point is copyright is actually multiple rights bundled together. So most teachers say, well, that's right. I understand this copyright, but I am actually using it for educational fair use. So what does that mean? Well, this is a good definition taken from Stanford Copyright. There, there are many um, places to go on the internet, but this was a really nice uh, overview that, that I found. So in its most general sense, fair use is any copying of copyrighted material done for a limited and transformative purpose, such as to comment upon, criticize, or parody a copyrighted work. Such uses can be done without permission from the copyright owner. So I put in red. What I think the two the two most important points 
um, it means limited, limited and transformative purpose. What does that mean? Because most of the time, let's say if you were um, you wanted to use a um, a song in some of your materials that you were developing. Most of the time, uh, in a language classroom, for example, the original well, the original purpose of a song is to entertain. It's for enjoyment. Uh, and here it is truly a transformative purpose in that what you're trying to do is educate people using this particular song. And in the case of a language teacher, it's usually something of, about the language, the vocabulary, the grammar, perhaps the culture. So that would constitute most of, of how we use media uh, does fall under fair use because our purposes are in that sense transformative. We transform the original intent. We, in, we in, uh, intend to educate people with the different media that we're using. But the real problem is then limited, this notion of limited, because when we play a song, we want to play the song in its entirety. It's not usually a verse or, or a line from a song. And most of the, of the copyright law and fair use law says you're only allowed to use a small portion of an original. And that's really where people end up violating the notion of, of fair use. And people will say, well, and again, I, must, I, sh I should have prefaced this by saying that I'm not a lawyer, but I've talked to lots of, of lawyers here at the University of Texas about copyright law. And in discussions of educational fair use, uh, it really is a discussion about how to avoid risk or how to assess risk. And so it's true that you can put um, uh, something that's copyrighted, uh, like a music video or a, um, some kind of video or a text, you can put it behind an LMS, which then is password protected, right? That's really, that still is a violation if you're using usually a work in, in entirety, in its entirety. Um, but you lower your risk because the chance of somebody finding out is, is going to be very slim. So let me ask you, are you keeping it legal? So imagine that you, um, imagine you're this person. You say, I put all my copyrighted materials for my course on my school's password protected LMS, and that way only my students can access the material. So I'm not really breaking the law, right? Wrong. You are still breaking the law. So as I said, because you're using the work usually in its entirety, that's where you get into trouble. You're, you're, you're using it in a transformative way. So a simple way to make sure that you're keeping things legal if you're going to use the full copyrighted piece of content is to simply link. So you can give people links in your Canvas or your Blackboard site, whatever, your LMS, and that will keep it legal. <clears throat> but you know, there's, a much, there's an easier way to just avoid copyright violations, and that is just to avoid copyright. Don't use copyrighted materials. And there is an alternative universe that's out there, and that's really one of our goals here at Coral, is to tell people the good news of Creative Commons. The Creative Commons is conceptualized as this space that we can all share in. We are all creators. We create pedagogical content that could be quizzes or lesson plans or whatever. And we give back to this community, this communal space. That's the notion of creative commons. So we are explicitly creating, just as Joanna did, materials to be shared in this way. So instead of saying all rights reserved, or the C in the circle followed by the words all rights reserved, we now have two Cs in the circle that stand for creative commons followed by this concept of some rights reserved. I'm going to negotiate the rights with the end user. I, as the author or originator or publisher or whatever, I'm going to play with other people. So again, my, my little metaphor of somebody taking all the marbles and saying, they're all mine, you know, we're going to say, so they, they all belong to the group and we're going to play with them together. So one thing that often, um, is confusing to people when we talk about the notion of open education and licenses is the word free. Um, because in some words, in some languages, uh, the word open is translated differently. Libre or libre in French and in Spanish uh, is the translation usually of open. 
Um, and so there are actually two senses of the word open, uh, or excuse me, the two senses of the word free here. What people hear when I say free is, oh, it's gratis. It doesn't cost me anything. But that's not actually true. Uh, it, costs P it costs coral, for example, money to produce materials. Um, it's certainly free sometimes for the end user. They're not paying anything. But actually, the central meaning uh, for the notion of open is the notion of, of, of free as in it's, a, it's part of your fr freedom. It's like free speech. Um, and that is a, a silly little saying that um, open educators talk about they, they, when they try to explain this concept of open licenses. It's free, not free as in free beer, but free as a free speech. OK. So let's get right. This is the real crux of the matter, is recognizing the different kinds of CC licenses. And uh, they are, first of all, there are, as you see, there are six different CC licenses. And they have these little icons here. And it's pretty simple, actually. If you'll notice that after the, C, uh, the, the two Cs in the circle, all of the licenses carry the word buy. And that's in a little icon for a person that stands for attribution. So it's others can copy, distribute, display, perform, and remix your work if they credit your name as requested by you. That means attribution. So giving credit back to the originator. Now please note that all CC licenses carry attribution. Attribution then is like the sine qua non of, of how we do things in education. We exchange our ideas. We play off of each other. But we're not here to plagiarize each other. We're not stealing ideas. We're sharing our ideas. People who originate some kind of idea or a concept deserve credit for that. So all of them, uh, all these license carry attribution. Um, then we see <clears throat> the next license down. It says CC by SA. SA, and it, and it has this kind of, um, I don't know, like uh, in recycling, the kind of arrow that goes around in a circle there. So here, share alike means others can distribute your work only under a license identical to the one you have chosen for your work. Um, the way I think it's, it's, I think this is a bit of a misnomer. It's better to say license alike. In other words, what this means is once you put that license on a piece of work, every other subsequent uh, content has to have that license too. So it's license alike. Everything down the line must carry this license. In other words, I'm playing the game of open licensing. I want everybody who uses all this content to play the game in the same way. That's share alike. And then, <clears throat> let's see, you'll see it says no derivative works. Uh, the icon that has uh, the, the equal sign there. And it says, others can only copy, distribute, display, or perform verbatim copies of your work. So you can't change the work. It has to stay as it is. The work as it is should equal your copy. That's the equal signs. You can't change it. OK. Um, so you see, and then the next one, non-commercial, the very last icon there. Uh, this changes according to the cultural context. So of course, in the United States, we're going to have a dollar sign, but if you're in Japan, um, it's going to have a yen sign or a euro sign if you're in Europe and so forth. Uh, which brings up a point that Creative Commons licenses are international. They come in all kinds of different flavors, uh, and so you need to be aware of that. So again, going down from the very, t the, going from the top of the licenses, so CC BY means CC, just give attribution. That's all you have to do. You can use this work, but we want you to attribute it to the originator. Next down, CC uh, by SA. It means CC. Uh, it means you have to give attribution, and you have to share. Uh, you, you have you have to license all subsequent works in the same way with that uh, CC by SA. CC by NC. No, you're allowed to copy and do all kinds of things with it, but you can't make any money. No commercial. The next one, CC by ND, no derivative works. Okay, so you can copy and publish and do things with it, but you can't change it. 
and then three icons here by NCSA. Um, so I want you to attribute it to the originator, no, no commercial, and then everybody else has to have this license. And then finally, CC by NCND, no commercial, no derivatives. Okay. So another way of thinking about this <clears throat> is how open, from completely open to not not as open as you know, um, not uh, you can see for copyright. The C in the circle is completely restricted, all rights reserved to completely open, and completely open is something called uh, public domain. So take the copyright and just exit out. So here you don't even have to uh, give attribution. In fact, we may not even know who originated it. So there are works that will have a public domain sticker there. You're, you're allowed to do whatever you want to with it. So another way of thinking about this is that it's really there are degrees of openness to, to these different licenses. Now, going back to the original slide of Joanna's OER, the one that she wrote uh, for her students at Cornell and that she in turn turned around and shared it with the world, that is licensed under CC BY. So that's the most open Creative Commons license. You're able to do what you want to with it as long as you give credit to her as the originator. <clears throat> so let me take a, just a quick break here and see if you were paying attention. Uh, pop quiz. And I want you to write your lessons in, I, I want you to write your, your answers uh, to the questions right here in the little box there. I'll give you a minute. So which license allows you to copy and publish? A, B, C, or D? And to, can a language teacher use a copy? So let's just take the first one. Okay, let me give you a minute. What do you think? A, B, C, or D? So I wanted you to go into the questions box, and you'll see you have a little chat box right there. Carol wrote A. So she thinks CC by allows you to copy and publish. Actually interesting to see the dynamics here, of course. So Lawrence is going to follow Carol's lead. So I have two for A, CC BY. CC BY allows you to copy and publish. Uh, Marcelo asks, Marcelo, you always ask good questions. What kind of publishing are we talking about? Yeah, well, I left that unspecified, so just, just you know, um, imagine then the context of a classroom, so publishing on the internet to be used with anybody. Okay, I have a D. Kyle wrote D, and that's what I was actually, that is the correct answer, D. So let's just think about this. CC BY, what does that require of you? That you give attribution. You can copy, you can publish, you can remix, you can do everything else, but you just have to give attribution. B, CC by NC means that you can copy and you can publish it to the world, send it out there, but you can't um, put a price on it. It's non-commercial, right? And CC by ND means you can copy it and publish but you're not allowed to make derivatives. You can't change it. So it's kind of one of those tricky questions. Uh, so A, B, and C, those licenses all allow you to copy and somehow distribute it, um, but, it doesn't, um, but it doesn't allow you to uh, make commercial, co commercial copies or to change the text in any way. Let's try number two. Can a language teacher use the copyrighted text for educational purposes? Okay, I have a couple. Yeah, oh, everybody's writing C. I was kind of wishy-washy there, and of course that's the right answer. It kind of depends. Um, it depends on how you're using the copyright, because fair use puts some restrictions, and the restrictions that I talked about were it has to be limited, and it has to be transformative. And I said most teachers transform the original purpose, but then they use the entire text, and that gets them into to trouble. Okay, 
So you're doing pretty well. Let's try one more, two, two more uh, questions here. So which license does not allow changes to the original work? You're not allowed. Explicitly states no changes. Okay, well, I see a trend developing. D is the right answer because it says ND, which means no derivatives. And the symbol is going to be then that little um, equal signs there because you're not allowed to change it. What you start with is what it should equal what you end with. So no changes to the original work. And the last question here, number four, do all CC licenses require attribution? Yeah, it's like I can, I'm looking in this chat box here. So people write, go A, bald on record, absolutely. And some people say, well, yeah, A, but I'm not quite sure. Um, the answer is A, all licenses, every single CC license comes with attribution. As I said, it was, it's kind of the sine qua non. You cannot have a CC license without attribution. Um, I might have confused you because there, there's something else called public domain that's really not part of the what we conceptualize as CC licenses. It's just that stuff that exists on the internet uh, that has no originating author. But the, all six of those CC licenses start with attribution. So they all ask you to do that. OK, so that was just to kind of, I think you've, you've got a sense of them. Uh, you, you can go to creativecommons.org. Dot org and take a look. They have the licenses up there, and then they have it explained for you a little bit better than I'm going very quickly today. Um, so now that you kind of understand, ah, okay, that's what CC licenses are. How do you find the content? Because the content exists because it, it carries a CC license, um, and so we want make, to make sure that people explicitly license their content so people know exactly what they can do with it. There's a lot of content out there that people intend to share, um, but it's not made explicit. So oftentimes you have to contact the author and say, hey, I found your great website. I'd like to use this, but uh, is this copyrighted? So there is this great thing called CC Search. It is uh, actually a page uh, that you can find on the um, Creative Commons website. And what you have here are all these different search engines that search different kinds of archives all over the internet repositories. Um, but it, they're all, all these search engines are optimized to search only CC license open content. In other words, if you go to Google and you type in, you do a word search, you're going to get millions of hits and much of that, probably most of that will be copyrighted material. So this is your one-stop shopping place to do uh, searching for open content or CC licensed content. And you can see, you can enter then, you can, you can uh, filter it. I want something, I want content that I can use for commercial purposes or that I can modify, et cetera. So for example, um, there are all kinds there as, uh, I got this off of Creative Commons, 9 million websites using Creative Commons licenses, but these websites themselves are huge. So YouTube, for example, constitutes a website. And there are 2 million videos, now more than 2 million videos, that are open or CC licensed. Wikipedia, 34 million articles that you can use that are open. Flickr, 300 uh, million photos. And PLOS stands for uh, Public Library of Science, 10,000 science articles. Um, Wattpad is a great website all about uh, different people writing stories, different kinds of genres of stories. And that, by the way, this exists in different languages. Everybody's sharing this with CC licenses. Scribd is an incredible website that uh, actually takes documents from magazines and newspapers, so 50 million documents that are under CC license and so forth. Jamendo, looking for different kinds of songs. OK, um, so these are di different places that these search engines will, will uh, find content from. But let me just show you how, what this looks like with Flickr. If you just go to Flickr, in other words, you can go to CC Search and do all of your shopping right there. Or you can go to then the, the different sites themselves, like Flickr, which is a, a, a sharing site for images. And there you want to specify, you see uh, it has a pull down menu where you want to filter the different kinds of images. 
and you indicate all Creative Commons licenses. So I only want images that are, are Creative Commons licensed. And so you're a French teacher, you want to look for uh, the Eiffel Tower, for example, and you're going to find out that there are thousands of pictures. Um, and so here's, here's just one example. So here's a photographer, Rob Lee. I don't know whether Rob is uh, just an amateur photographer or a professional photographer, whatever, but he uploaded this image. And take a look at this. He's named it Eiffel Tower at Night. That's the title of this image. And he's given, he's licensed it. So it is a CC by, and then the, that little circle means no derivatives. You can't change it. So he's giving you the right to use this image, but he doesn't want you to go in and Photoshop it and change it. Okay. So if you were to use it uh, in your lessons, then you'd have to follow that particular license, the restrictions that he's placed on it. Okay. That's an example from Flickr. If you were to go to YouTube and you're still putting together this lesson on the Eiffel Tower, you can also filter YouTube uh, by Creative Commons. They have a, a pull-down menu there the Eiffel Tower, Creative Commons, you're going to get, again, thousands of free videos shot. Some of them are professionals, most of them amateur. Okay. Now, if you don't want to find content that's free and you're just looking for OER, then you can go to what's called a repository. There are many repositories around the internet. Merlot, multi, a multimedia educational resource for language, for learning and online teaching not just for languages, it's for many different kinds of fields. OER Commons um, is, again, a general repository. But Laura was a great place. This is out of the uh, Open University in the UK, Languages Open Resources Online. And what's interesting about this uh, repository is you can look for something really granular like a lesson. They have lots of lo language lessons, or lessons written by language teachers. UCLA Language Materials Project, if you're looking for less commonly taught. But the mother load, I would say, is down here, the nflrc.org, which is all of the 16 National Foreign Language Resource Centers. We upload all of our content to this one repository. And we have a really nice search interface. You can look for reading materials or speaking materials. Um, you can look for different languages. You can specify the, the proficiency level, et cetera. And again, that's for looking for OER, Open Educational Resources. Now, once you, if you're writing a lesson and you want to um, license your lesson, you want to do that, of course, there are conventions, just like there are conventions when you're writing an academic paper and you want to cite an author correctly and then you want to include the bibliographic detail. So it, it depends on what type of content you're, you're dealing with, so books and journals. Uh, the convention here is it says include the relevant uh, attribution information next to the CC work or as a footer along the bottom of the work on the page that the work appears on and alternatively you can list the CC works in the back of the publication. In other words, if it's text you probably will end up putting it at the bottom of the page like you would uh, a footnote or at the back of its if it's several pages long your lesson and that acts as like a, a bibliography at the end. Photos and images um, we now have the convention of putting it, putting the, the relevant information right below the, the, the photograph itself. So on the edge, the bottom of the, of the, of the photograph. Slideshows uh, include the relevant attribution information next to the CC slot, next to the, next to the CC work, or as a footer along the bottom of the work. As you've noted here, um, all of these slides, we have given you permission because each slide carries a CC by uh, um, icon here. Film, podcasts, um, include the relevant attribution information with the work when it appears on the screen. If that's not possible, attribute the work in the credits. And then the podcast, mention the name of the artist and that it's under a CC license, at the, uh, usually at the beginning of the podcast. Okay. So again, those are the conventions of how to uh, tell people that you're using this kind of open content. <coughs> and I gave you, um, even though we're talking about just these little uh, icons here, what's great about them is that they're clickable and they can expand to more information. This shows you a CC by 
share alike. Um, and it tells you explicitly you are free to share. That means copy and redistribute the material. You can adapt it, meaning remix, transform, and build upon. And here's what you need to do. You must attribute and you must share alike. And it explains all of that. And furthermore, you can each one of these you can keep on clicking. And if you want legalese that will hold up in a court of law, that's also important. Uh, then you can keep drilling down and it gives you layers of information. So, okay, now you've found all this great content and you've put it together in a lesson and you've learned then the conventions. You realize that it has several different texts and they all have different ways of, of uh, attributing it. You figured all that out, you put it all together, and now you want to give it to, over to Coral. You want to participate in Flight. And here's what you do. You go to our website, flight.org org. Go to the How To menu, pull it down, and there will be, a, a under that menu, a How To Participate link. And that takes you here to this page. And you'll see um, there's a, a button for submitting a form or submitting a lesson, for, excuse me, submitting a text or submitting a lesson. The first place you should actually go is right here, the author template. You click on that, and it will give you a kind of a draft. Um, this is a Google Doc, and it will prompt you the kind of information that we want you to fill out. So we want you to give your lesson a title, for example lesson title and instructional language. Okay, the text is in Spanish, but what language are you going to be using in your instructions and so forth? So we want you to fill all that out and gather all that information. And then once you do that, you can click on the other buttons than the, less, the lesson submission form. And it's basically cut and paste all that information into that form and submit it to us. Now, once we get it, we send it out to uh, reviewers, and we've just finished a review, and I'll be sending that out today to Marcelo, for example, who is, uh, is participating. And um, so we, we basically have editorial boards of expert reviewers, people who are applied linguists or language program directors, and they are um, well-versed in how to put together these materials. They will evaluate it according to a lesson rubric or um, uh, a flight lesson rubric. And then we ask them, people, to pay attention to the, the, the feedback that they've been given and then resubmit. So here's what the, the checklist or the rubric looks like. We evaluate it according to the lesson structure, level appropriateness, right? Um, there's a, a field that we ask you to fill out. Is this for college students, high school students, proficiency level, et cetera? Is the lesson well scaffolded? Are all the are activities sequenced in a coherent fashion and so forth? Uh, in addition, we ask then about the flight principles. Do you get your students to think textually, meaning do you get them to think in terms of a genre um, and in terms of the thematics? Contextual thinking, do you ask them questions about background information and background about how the text is a cultural practice itself? And then literary thinking, the, the concept of a literary in the everyday. Do you bring in this notion of these categories of play that we mentioned at the beginning? And finally, of course, open education, do you know how to uh, license? Do you, have you paid attention to the license? Have you given attribution, so forth? So let me end by this, since we're right on, right on time here. The whole point of flight is to, is to create a community of practice. Now, Joanna and I, going back to the very beginning, we created a dialogue between two people. But we really want to expand that dialogue to incorporate many more people. Instead of just having two language program directors talk to each other about these materials, we want to have lots of people, including graduate students and people from all over the country, help each other learn how to create these materials together. That's the real goal. We also are then trying to create this platform for publishing these goals. because. That's where we kind of add this, this value of a language resource center that we can have um, people who understand how to publish this, um, put it on the server, and how to have others gain access to it. That's what we can add, the value that we can add to this endeavor of the community of practice. Uh, ultimately, we'd like to have an archive of all these lessons, these lessons being based on authentic texts. 
and these texts and the lessons will be tagged with metadata so that you can search them. You can search by language, by genre, by thematics, and so forth. And finally, very importantly, now you know that the emphasis is on shareable content, so they have to carry open uh, Creative Commons licenses. So our goal, of course, is to uh, educate language program directors about open education and, of course, the importance of Creative Commons licenses. So that's it. That's what I wanted to talk to you today about. Mm. Yeah, Joanna raises a really good point. <clears throat> so let me direct your attention to uh, what she says here in the chat box. Uh, helpful to mention once again that folks can submit an open lesson for closed or open text. So obviously I'm promoting the use of open content. But let's say you want to um, create a lesson around a text that is a copyrighted text. And you've chosen to do, uh, I don't know, I, I'm using the example of a music video, something that's recent and that the students know. Um, and that could get you obviously into a lot of trouble with the music industry because if it's a brand new something that just came out and it's available on iTunes, then they don't want you certainly to, to distribute it to your students. Um, so again, if we, we want lessons for both open content, but you can also use closed content. In that case, we would just use a link to some place on the internet where you can access that content. So you would simply give the link to the music video if it's a copyrighted music video or a link to the copyrighted text and so forth. So we do, ex we do accept both in, in flight. Uh, we don't want to limit it just to open content. But it's easier once you go down this road, as I talked to Joanna when she started to really brainstorm ideas, I said, you know, I, I, <laughs> I was a broken record with her. I said, it's a great idea, but you're using closed content here. It probably exists as an open. There, you might find something that's similar that's open. So, um, but yes, it's a good point. To, to You can do both. Now, Vivian has raised the question, what if we don't have a link? because it's not available online? Oh, that's a great question. Because uh, 99% of the... So, um, Vivian, I guess I'd like to ask you to give me more specifics. What are you talking about there? We might be able to turn it into a link or create content that you own around something. Something that you can't find online, for example, but you know is published uh, it's a print, a printed text. Um, chances are then you'll be able to find some information about the text. It may not be the text itself. That then um, you, you would have to give information about how to access the, the actual object that you are using as the content for a lesson. That's about the best I could do there. So I see that we are right at 3 o'clock, right on the hour. Um, I will stay here for a couple more minutes to answer questions. Um, but I just I really want to thank everybody for showing up. And uh, if you do have questions that come to you after the webinar, you can certainly send them in. Uh, and please visit us at flight. That's F-L-L-I-T-E dot O-R-G. We have a big website full of information including all, all four of the webinars that we've already given you. Thank you. And thanks again to, Errol, to all those who've participated. Uh, Natalie just gave you the link there, um, the URL. Yeah, and Joanna's raising another good point here. Is it, yeah, um, that this is really about professional development. And... Um, not just for graduate students, but for all of us who are in the profession to learn more about oh, all the different tricks of the trade, how to access free information, open content, how to put it together in a lesson, um, what are the basic principles of a multiliteracy uh, approach to language. So yes, it's great for all of us, but especially for graduate students who are working on putting together uh, a portfolio. That's a great point. Thank you for reminding me. OK, well, I'm going to take off then. Thank you all for participating and being here today. And uh, see you soon on another flight webinar. Bye-bye.